Ağudu billahi minşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi rabbil alamin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala al-mab'uthi rahmeten lil alamin. Ve nusalli aleyhi fil avvalin ve fil ahirin ve fil mele'il a'la ya rabbil alamin. Usikum nafsi bi taqwa allahi azze ve cel. Kema jaa fi muhkem el tenzil. Ya eyyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqatih. ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون. Dear brothers and sisters, we always begin with praise and gratitude, as our faith is in the one that made us and has provided us with everything we have. We recognize that life is a test, and the single most blessing in this test is that we have guidance. We have a innate, inherent. motivation to know God and to know purpose and at the same time the prophets have been sent with miracles and revelation and we have come to embrace this final revelation of the Quran to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So continuing our discussion from last week, we discussed this institution, how are we going to organize our priorities as an identity. So we discussed the mission and the vision last week. Today we will talk about the core values. What are the core driving values that will help us to achieve that vision through following that general mission? So the first value that we have as the Muslim community center of Charlotte is that our center, our mosque is welcoming. Is welcoming for all. For man, for woman, for young, for senior, for black, for brown, for white. Everyone we recognize comes in here at a unique place on their spiritual journey. So this is a jam-packed core value that carries certain meanings. One of them is obviously the Prophet ﷺ was sent as the Holy Quran says, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا Say to all of mankind, say to everyone, I have been sent as the messenger of God to all of you. All of you. The Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was not sent to the Arabs. He was not sent to the white people or the black people or people who speak this language or that language. He was sent to all of mankind. And so we are all part of that reality. And one of the most important things as we engage and embrace this diversity of humanity and the backgrounds that we've had is to understand how is that relationship going to come when you have people with different backgrounds. Because you have people with different cultural experiences, people with different political experiences, people with different perspectives. So how do we deal with it? The Prophet Sallallahu said, مَا كَانَ الرِّفْقُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَانَ وَمَا نُزِعَ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا شَانَ That any time a gentle dealing was the way of someone, everybody thinks that person is a beautiful person. And whenever someone is rigid and harsh, it makes them ugly in the mind of people. People don't like that person. And so some people we have seen across the world in my travels and in different mosques, some people go to mosques and feel themselves the owner of the mosque, feel the scholars that they follow are the absolute truth of the religion, and then they go around nitpicking at everybody and judging everybody and making people feel unwelcome. This has happened across the world, where some people, they go into a mosque and they feel within a very short time, or a very long time, that someone is making them feel uncomfortable. And so, this is something we do not want to cultivate in this mosque. There was a big study done by young American Muslims, and they did a documentary of sorts called Unmosked. And what they were discussing was, Back in the late 80s and through the 90s, a lot of the community has built mosques. Big, beautiful mosques. And back then, for some time, up until the mid-2000s, early 2000s, most of those mosques were vibrant and there was lots of things going on. But they saw towards the end of the 2000s, to 2008, 9, 10, until now, we're finding that many of the mosques are empty. Very small group, and usually it's an older group of bearded men, very, almost no women at all, and kids are never there and are not wanting to be there. 
as well as women. And we have to ask ourselves, why is that? If these people who are there at the mosque are embodying the real example of the Prophet ﷺ, what do you think would happen? Jam-packed. People would want to go there. They would feel that gentle concern for their well-being, that loving embrace that was the Prophet ﷺ. You see, some people feel like the idea of Amr bin Ma'roof is some sort of personal injunction and that they feel themselves scholars or muftis or something and that whatever they've heard is some absolute truth of the religion and they go around nitpicking at people. They go around judging people. We want people to come here at their spiritual place and feel welcome and comfortable wherever they're at. As was the case with the Prophet. Look at the example of Musa and Harun, of Moses and Aaron, alayhim as salatu was salam. That when God told them to go to Pharaoh, He said, "Idhaba ila Fir'auna innahu tara, faqula lahu qawla al-layyina la'allahu yatadhakkar wa yaqsha." Go to Pharaoh of all people, not the innocent, poor, little, young Muslim or the Muslim who's never really studied their religion and doesn't know all the rules, or that convert who just walked in. No, someone who is a tyrant, oppressor, who said he was God. And what did Allah tell Moses and Aaron about how to deal with that guy? Talk to him in a gentle, kind way that perhaps maybe he would remember his soul's essence and his purpose in life and be aware of moral purpose. That's what he said about that. Imagine just some person who's not very knowledgeable and not very strong in their faith and practice coming to the mosque. Somebody says, look brother, this is what you're doing. Look at the outfit, what are you doing and all of that. Be like, man, that place is like some sort of a attack zone, not a welcoming embrace. Brothers and sisters, this is the secret of the success of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, it is from the mercy and compassion of God that you Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam were sent to the people with a gentle easy going style and if you would have been harsh or rigid nobody would have followed you they would have ran away from you this is what Allah is saying about the secret of the success we have to have the wisdom to understand and respect the Meccan reality we are living in here. Even in the Muslim world, it's no Medina. Let's be honest. I mean, I've been to Medina, it's pretty Medina over there, mashallah. But the rest of the Muslim world has a lot of do to catch up to that beautiful, comforting, peaceful, loving experience. Even Mecca, just some hours away. If you've been to Hajj, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So we live in a society where the Muslims are a small group and a small minority around a big majority and there is a big movement amongst them to make everybody hate us. So there are different priorities and attitudes we would take according to the way Allah made the priorities when He was revealing Qur'an to Meccan Muslims. Those are going to be high on the totem pole of priorities. How do we Start. How, what is our emphasis? Is it on telling people about uh, outfits, beard lengths, and things like that? It is not. We don't see the Prophet ﷺ making issues about that in Mecca. When we see Ja'far ibn Abi Talib an, when he went to uh, Habasha in the first migration of the Muslims because of the oppression and tyranny of the Quraysh. His explanation was, we used to be a people who believed and our character was like this. Now we have gained faith and new God and prophethood. Now our character is like this. He didn't say, and we have iqamatu salah and this and, and these things and this rule and that and the haircut and this and that and the other. You see what I'm saying? This is where we have to gain wisdom. Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawidati al hasana wa jadilhum billati hi ahsan. Call to the path of your Lord with wisdom. We talked about it last week. 
knowing who you're talking to and understanding and respecting their place on their personal spiritual journey and making them feel comfortable and bringing them in and building a human connection with them. Not based upon some ethnic reality, but based upon a spiritual reality. That is the emphasis that we have. And then at the end of that ayah, what do you say? Inna rabbaka huwa a'lamu biman dalla an sabilihi wa huwa a'lamu bil muhtadin. La tuzakku, la fala tuzakku anfusakum. Don't be like, I'm on the haq. I know the religion, I'm sahib deen wa ilm wara. And so I'm going to go around and fix all these characters who don't know their religion. Look at this guy, he doesn't even know what we'll do. Let me fix him. I'm telling you, that's not how we start. There was no wudu understood and practiced until the Muslims in the first phase got established. And then the iqamah salah was just a couple of salah a day. And slowly but surely, people grow and develop according. We call it a tadarruj fit tashri'ah. It is the phase process by which God has decreed in His ultimate divine wisdom that people will grow. Why do many of the young people not follow the religion? Because they felt, and this is gharban wa sharqan, just so you know, they felt that the religion was presented to them as a set of rigid rules and regulations and it was kind of forceful. It wasn't a welcoming embrace of confident faith and growing with priorities that were found in the Qur'an and the Sunnah away according to the way Allah Azza wa Jal taught the Prophet Sallallahu and the early believers. So that is our first uh, core value. We are welcoming for everyone. Male, female, young, senior, elder, black, brown, white, everyone. Muslim, non-Muslim. Non-Muslim want to come in, Ahlul Salam. They came to the Prophet Sallallahu I'll, I'll never forget when I was a new Muslim, somebody brought some non-Muslims and then was one brother who, you know, mashallah, bearded brother and everything, got his pants like this one, and he told me, he said, you cannot have non-Muslims kuffar in here. And then another brother agreed, he said, they're najis. Wallahi, I saw this. And I thought, I don't know, maybe there's something I'm not aware of, you know, they know the religion better than me. Then I studied the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Ja wafdun min al-Najran, min Najran. This group came from Yemen, they're Christians. And they came to meet the Prophet ﷺ. He welcomed them in the mosque and let them pray in the corner. Hakkaqahu Ahmed Shakir, one of the greatest muhadditheen. That this is a riwayah thabita. But you have this mentality. There is some sickness in the Muslim world that we have to heal. And that is why we're setting core values so that that sickness does not come into this institution. Whoever is going to call themselves proud of being Muslim and create an environment and an attitude that makes people run away or, or feel uncomfortable, that is not right. By, we say we look at cause and effect. The Prophet ﷺ, how was he? People kept coming to him, coming to him, growing, growing, growing. If what you're doing, nobody's going to be around you, nobody likes you, your mosque is dwindling, then that is probably because you're not following the Prophet ﷺ. The irony of this is some people might say, let's leave that mosque because of what he's teaching. That is the supreme irony of what we're talking about right now. The second one, the second core value. We seek to understand the mainstream teachings of Islam as it relates to our reality that we live in. We don't want to import fatwas from scholars who lived across the world that they're thinking according to what they're living and how the law applies there. First of all, what does it mean? Mainstream. We call Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. The mainstream of Islam. 88% of the Muslim Ummah is saying that what we know from our legacy is that the Prophet وسلم, when he passed away, he left the Ummah, as is mentioned in Surah Al-Ma'idah, with the complete religion. Everything's there. All we need to know, we have the Qur'an, and the scholars were amazingly inspired, miraculously, to work very hard and meticulously, scrupulously, to make sure that we can confirm what can we rely is what the Prophet وسلم, said. And what is doubtful and what is completely rejected in how we should remind people that even though it sounds beautiful or it sounds nice or it says Rasulullah said we can confirm by the scientific methodology we have that he did not say such a thing right so whatever's in there we have great scholars 
who have taken from that. We have a huge legacy. There's four main known legal jurists whose school of thought permeated and became stronghold. You have Imam Abu Hanifa, the father of the schools of codified law. You have Imam Malik, the Imam of Dar al-Hijra, the Imam of the children, grandchildren of the Prophet and his companions. And then you have the great scholar Imam al-Shafi'i, who was this great scholar who sat with many scholars and proved himself to be in his own field. And Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, Imam al sunnati wal Jama'ah, Imam al uh, he came as the end. Now, in addition to that, you may not know that there are 90, 90 scholars that when you study IFTA and you study the concept of legal derivation methodologies, that there are 90 real prominent scholars Imam al Thawri, Imam al Uzai, Imam al Shawkani, Imam al Zahabi, Imam so and so and so and so, and we can go on and on and on and on, Abdul Hazm and so forth. Many that we can take from them on the well established evidences and proofs that they brought. The difference between them and these four skulata are two. Number one, they didn't necessarily give a full codified presentation of the whole entire sharia and it was uh, set and standardized as a proof against others who would differ with them, which those four have that. Number two, the students that they had did not have that drive to go around and promote in a very strong, aggressive, clear way that their teacher was the imam of the time. The other four, they had that precedence. But those are great mujtahideen in the religion. So that's what mainstream means. And wal jama'ah, it means we should be all collective. Meaning what? There's all these different opinions. Everybody here is convinced with or was raised on different opinions and approaches of Islamic legal theory. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah. One of the great scholars of the history of Islam, one of the great mujtahideen, who's one of those that aren't from the four, even though he was originally Hanbali, he distinguished himself as his own Imam. He said, 90% of all of the Masail Fiqiyya are Ijtihadiyya. Only 10% Mujma Alayha. Very small group that you can say, this is Islam. But yet, many Muslims have the audacity. Wala taqfu ma laysa laka bi'ilm. Don't go around acting like you know everything or that you've figured it all out or that the ummah where it is common things that we see must be purely Islam. It couldn't be that we've deviated in some ways looking at the ummah right now. Of course it should be that we have. Look at our ummah. We need to go back and study different scholars and listen to what they said, listen to their arguments and disputes and discussions. So we have to respect that people are following different interpretations of the truth of this law and we're not here to control people or force them because why the scholar said la inkar fi masail al-ijtihad and some of them said la inkar fi masail al-ikhtilaf there can be no rebuking others in matters of disagreement or in matters of scholarly interpretation which is the vast majority of our law like one brother he told me he said imam this is not right I have heard that you are having a khutbah before the zawal. Therefore, I'm going to go tell everybody that this is wrong. Would you tell Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal and many other great scholars, Imam Shokani, Imam Ibn Hazm and others, if they were standing here today saying, this is an authentic opinion, which is what we know they said, right? You would tell that great Imam that you're wrong because I follow some other sheikh? Who are you? Who are you? لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من كبر. Now, anyone will go into heaven if they have this much kibr in their heart. The assumption that I'm right and I know my opinion. It's not your opinion, man. تقي الله. So we have to have that calmness. We have to have that understanding of you know what? There's different of opinions. There's different scholarly schools of thought. I'll follow what I'm convinced with. And these are my brothers and sisters in Islam. I respect them wherever they're doing. So now the question is, we understand the mainstream of Islam as it relates to our reality right here. So I'm just going to go through uh, something called Al-Ma'roof. Kalimat Ma'roof in the Quran and the Sunnah is known to mean Mastahsanuhu al-Shara' wal-Aql wal-Uf. Whatever ma'roof, it means to be known as good, literally. It doesn't mean good, it means to be known as good. How is it known? First from the Quran and the Sunnah, it said that's a good thing. It's revelation, that's the top. Secondly, the sound intellect of people deem it as good, and it does not. لا يخالفوا 
Nassan Shari. It does not go against a clear teaching of the scripture. So it's a matter of cultural tendency. The text is not necessarily clear, or there's no text on that issue, and it's a matter outside of worship. So here's where what the scholars have said about this. By the way, whenever Hind bint Utba, the wife of Abu Sufyan, came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, you know, Abu Sufyan Radiallahu he's not giving me what I feel is my right, and I feel like I'm living in a under the life I've always lived for whatever reason. He said, Khudi ma yakfiki wa waladiki bil ma'roof. He says, Take whatever would suffice you and your children with ma'roof. The scholars interpreted what is reasonable. How do we know is reasonable? What everybody knows is reasonable. Where? Where we live. That's how they interpreted this hadith. The Hanafi school of thought in their books of legal derivation, Usul al Fiqh. How do I get to a ruling? They said, التعيين بالعرف كالتعيين بالنص To specify something in the law with culture is exactly equivalent to doing it with a eye or hadith. They said, الثابت بالعرف كالثابت بالنص What is well established and proven with the custom of the people and it does not conflict with the religion is equally like the clear teaching of the Quran and the Sunnah. What are we learning here? We're learning that Islam respects human realities. It gave some the parameters and boundaries to protect us from the evil of ourselves and the work of the shaitan around us. But there's this attitude, I call it the haram police. We talked about it with our Sunday school. We were talking about nawaqid al wudu, the things that will break your wudu. And I asked, I said, do you know this and that and other? And one of them said, if you touch a dog, I said, how many of you think that if you touch a dog, you need to make wudu? I'm going to say almost every kid raised his hand. And there were 50 there. There were 50. It's all the teenage group, 11, 12 and up. Are you aware that there is no Quran, no Sunnah, and no scholar that ever said this? Some of you are like, really? I always heard that. This is a proof that Muslims go around exaggerating things and conflating and confusing things. There is an issue about najasatul kalb, is it lu'ab, is it al jild, is it this and that, but that has to do with washing, has nothing to do with wudu. No scholar ever said that. You know what one young man said? He said, I was told by my uncle, you have to make wudu seven times if you touch the dog. And the majority opinion is, it's only the saliva. And some scholars said, the whole Maliki school said, the saliva of the dog is not najis. Bihal min al ahwal. If there is nothing, if a dog licks you, you can go pray and that's fine. This is Ammat al Jumhur, Jamahir al Ulama min al Malikiyya. North Africa, you will find it. You might lose your mind. How did this guy just go pray? I saw him playing with that dog. There's an issue about keeping a dog, we know that. That's a whole other issue. So, but that's my point is that people go around saying stuff and then it becomes sha'i, common thinking amongst the Muslims. And it's jahl, it's a complete confusion. So, Al Malikiya, Kulluma Utlika Lavduhu Humil Ara Ofihi. Anytime the legislation of Quran and Sunnah came out general, open, some general teaching, then we look to the culture. Is there something specific that the culture would bring that? He said, Al Malikiya, Al Amalu Bil Urfi Aslum in Usul al Madhab. To act according to the local custom is one of the foundational elements of our school of thought, Imam Malik said. Imam al-Shafi'i, ma utlika wa lam yuhad ruj'a fi dabtihi ila al-urf. Exactly as Imam Malik said. He said, whatever was made general in the scripture, and there was no clear exact teaching, then we go to the culture and say, how can we specify this one? Imam al-Shafi'i said, al-'adatu muhakkamatun. The custom of people is a authoritative legislative means. Al Hanabila, Mala Haddalahu Fishara Yuradu il Urf. Something that doesn't have a specific ruling in the law of Islam, we go to the culture and we say, What do you guys understand about this thing? And if that doesn't go against what we know from another clear teaching, that becomes a law of Islam. You see how Islam pays attention to the local custom? And the asl of this is Al-Arab. And they were Mushrikeen, so don't say, Nahnu fi Amrika. Don't be like that. That's wrong. 
That is a wrong understanding. You don't say, well, this is the land of Kufr. The original way they applied this was the Arab of the Quraysh. They were looking to that custom and how the people took it in. And they said, whatever we know as Arab, as long as it doesn't go against. And they're mushrikeen. So don't be like, Amrika kullu fasid haram and all of that. This is completely wrong, politicized, confused understanding of the religion. We have to stay in reality. I'll give you one example. Some of the brothers are going to have a hard time with this one. So one brother came to me one time. He said, Imam, you know, I'm in college now and everything. And, you know, I'm starting to, you know, I have my own style and everything. So I'm wearing this necklace. I said, oh, what kind of a necklace is it? He says, just a silver chain. Culturally here, we have this silver chain thing. I said, is it gold? No, no, no gold. White gold? No, no. Do you have a pendant on there you think is holy or something? Like benefits you or something? He said, no. I said, okay, no problem, man. He said, well, my dad said that this is for girls and that I am not doing a major sin. I said, if you're living in your dad's house, you have to respect it. That is your urf over there in your dad's house. That's his house. If that's what he feels because he comes from a land where that's where they see it. In the urf has decided in much of the Arab world that a necklace is specific to women. The Prophet ﷺ did not make any decision about a necklace. He made a decision about tashabbuh rijal bin nisa wal aks. He said, don't imitate the opposite gender. Ma utlika lafduhu. Yurja'u fi daddihi ila al urf. So you look back to the local custom to rule. So in, for sure, if I am in Kuwait or Saudi or somewhere, and the young man asks the same question, I say, La yajuz, akhya la tashabbuh bin nisa. That's how I will tell him there. What I know of the shara. Here I'm going to tell him, we all know that necklaces, male and female, it's ko, it's musharak. Right? That being said, all of you young men here, thinking now I'm going to give my necklace. Better respect your parents because bir al-walidin min akbar al-usul. When you grow up, make your own life, you go outside, you have your own family, make your own whatever opinion you follow from Ahl sunnah al no problem. But you have to respect your parents. So that is the custom, and so Ibn, Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyyah, so I'm running out of time. Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyyah, when he wrote his book, Alam al muwaqi'in he made half of that book dedicated to, when you're knowing the law, and you understand all of the shara and the lugha and all of this, you have to know who you're applying it to. Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyyah, half of that book is saying, we have to know ahwal, the situation of the people who are being applied to this law. So the next one is we aspire to embody the lofty example our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This place we want to revive, we want to reform ourselves and revive the real sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. According to the real priorities Allah and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave to the sunnah of the... When people say the sunnah, I think there's a wrong emphasis by too many religious folks. They have a very superficial emphasis that is very not difficult to perform. But the akhlaq of the Prophet ﷺ is the essence of his sunnah. It is the influence of the ibadah. The worship leads one to be godly. Because that's who I'm devoted to and connected to. I want to be like his asma wa sifat in my flawed human way. So the Prophet ﷺ had two main qualities that he was known for. Rahmah and Ihsan. He was benevolent. He was caring. He was compassionate. He was merciful. He was kind. He was gentle. He was selfless. He wasn't about his own self and his own ego and his own desires. He was out looking to make other people's lives better. He was about making the society a better place. By his word and deed. And that was altogether a jihad. One of the greatest jihads is one guy reading some ayat. In 23 years, the whole entire people are believing and following him and changing their whole entire lifestyle because of this message that was revealed to this man. Because had that same message been given to a different type person, nobody would follow you. So we try to follow the Prophet I'm going to try to get this done real quick, inshallah. We 
encourage the involvement and leadership of the young people and the ladies in our community. There is a very unfortunate reality across the world that is a extremist, exaggerated, culturally applied understanding of the religion. And that is that women usually don't go to mosques. And then people say like, what happened to the young generation? The women do not have deep spirituality because the spiritual epicenter of the community is not welcoming them. They don't feel comfortable there. When Allah said, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ جَمِيعًا يَأْمُرُونَ جَمْعًا يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَيُطِيعُونَ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُطُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَيُطِيعُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ The believing men and the believing women together are practicing and preaching this religion as a unit. And when we look in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, we will see men and women involved in the whole thing. The mosque, they were there, praying together. Lots of women, always. The Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, it was their sunnah to pray Fajr and Isha in the mosque. This is in Bukhari and Muslim and all of that. Now somebody might say, well yeah, but women are fitna. Actually the hadith is saying, the fitna is yours, O men that you will allow something about women to bother you. The, the hadith is not a condemnation of all women and blanket sweeping teaching as fitna. This is oppression and this is an incorrect understanding of the religion. Some women can be fitna, but many men can also be fitna. I've seen it. I've seen lots of men doing fitna in many ways. And see, some people think that fitna is only related to a sexual thing. It is not. Fitna means in general turmoil, creating problem. So we want to welcome our women in our mosque as the Prophet ﷺ did. And we know that we have different varying levels of men sitting here. One time one brother said, uh, yeah, but sometimes these ladies, I see them dressed in such a way. I said, number one, brother, why are you staring at her? Number two, I've been sitting in the Jumu'ah whenever I was not the Imam, and I see uh, from behind many brothers' aura is showing. Then I say, brother, get out of here. Your fitna, this is not allowed. You don't come here anymore. All of you brothers now could possibly do this, so therefore no men in the masjid. Malakum kayfa tahkumun. Well, what is this? We need to go back to the sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam. One brother got very angry when I said, you know, what we know is that there was a certain custom of the way women dressed. And then in the middle of the Medani period of Revelation, this concept of modest dress and covering head to toe, covering up all of the openings, it was revealed in two verses of the Quran. Before that, it was not a law. So our mother Khadija anha, lived and died and did not wear a hijab like these women are wearing a hijab. We don't have any evidence that would say she was. She was like a woman like everyone else. Does that mean that she was doing something immoral and evil? It means that people grow and learn and they can be great people wherever they're at because of sincerity and piety. Inna Allah alimun sudur. It's not our business. فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ you don't judge one because this one had this. I remember whenever I went to Egypt, I had been brainwashed that any one man, man who shaved his face is some sort of terrible guy, fasik, zahid, yani he's going to hell. I understood this from many of the Muslims I was around. Then I met Sheikh Sayyid Fathi, Hafizullah Ta'ala. I have yet to meet too many people of the pedigree of character and worship and all of that that he was on. Actually, he won the 1995 World Competition of Qur'an Recitation and Memory. But he wears a mustache and a shaved face in his society. For whatever reason, he has his reasons. I don't go judging people because of what they look like. I don't go putting myself as above other people because I think it. Many of the kids, we judge them. Many of these kids have solid, good, clean hearts. The Prophet ﷺ emphasized the role of kids in the community. There's this attitude. Those are just kids. They play. 
We are the grown-ups. The Prophet ﷺ was like, here, 9, 10, 11, come sit with us. Let's learn. Here, I'll hold you. Let's talk about things. كانت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كانت الإماء من إماء كانت الأمة من إماء أهل المدينة لتأخذ بيد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فينطلق حيث شاءت. This is a hadith in Bukhari. Some young slave girl, simple girl, would come and say, "Rasul Allah," and she would take his hand and he would say, "Where do you want to go?" And he starts smiling. We'd be like, "Look, I am Rasul Allah. I have important things to do." The Prophet ﷺ emphasized leadership from the young people in many ways. We want to see young leaders in our community. We want to see young people feeling welcomed and comforted in our community. This is the sunnah, the forgotten sunnah. Anas bin Malik, he said, I lived in the Prophet's house for 10 years. I don't remember when he said, Anas, why haven't you done this? Why don't you do that? That's the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا فإنه هو الغفور الرحيم. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. يا الله we ask you to emphasize in us the beautiful example of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. يا الله we ask you to put in our hearts the light and wisdom of the Holy Quran. Ya Allah, we ask you to make us a people who are gentle and kind and compassionate and merciful, embracing, warm and welcoming. Ya Allah, we ask you to make our community a place that grows because of the attitude of the people in it and how they deal with others. Ya Allah, we ask you to make us a people who are presenting this message successfully and gaining new people in our community and show, showing the light of Allah in this world. Ya Allah, we ask you to make us a people who emphasize the value of our mothers, our sisters, our daughters in this community. Ya Allah, please give them the greatest leadership posts that you have willed for them according to the way you have created them and according to what their abilities are. Ya Allah, we ask you to make in our young people people who can truly stand up for faith with knowledge and wisdom and a strong audacity and courage to be proud of who they are with a message to the world because of the example of those great young leaders as we know from Surah Al-Kahf and all throughout the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Allah, we ask you to make us a people who are those who are seeking knowledge, who are seeking a deeper wisdom of the religion. Ya Allah, help our understanding of religion be the pure regulating factor and that our culture is something that is regulated according to our religion. That our knowledge grows, that our wisdom grows, that we become better people and we do not stay stagnant in one form that we have had for many years. Ya Allah, we ask you to guide us to the straight path and make us of those of guidance that are guiding others. Ya Allah, we ask you to return us to the beautiful lofty example of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. And aqim as-salah.